All right, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome you to this first of a series of seminars as part of this research uh, uh, in related to breakthroughs in water security. Uh, my name is Jeff McDonald. I'm a professor of hydrology and SENS and the associate director of the Global Institute for Water Security. And it's a, a thrill to have you here as part of this seminar series. This is sponsored by Howard Weider and the Global Institute. And uh, we're really delighted to have a number of distinguished visitors with us through the, through the fall term. This talk, like all the others, are simulcast. So with us now at, at other rooms at other universities, we have University of Manitoba, University of Calgary, uh, University of Alberta, and two of the schools uh, of UBC in Vancouver and Kelowna. So if you're listening, it's a real delight to have you uh, with us on this uh, simulcast. And for everyone else, this will be captured on the web. So if you've missed the talk or a colleague has missed it, you're welcome to uh, sign in and download it. For students that are taking this course for credit, there is a sign-in sheet, those in the 898 class. So this is a journal club that accompanies this class. Um, and if you could uh, make sure you sign that, uh, that would be great. Okay, so today's speaker is Danny Orr. Uh, Danny is a professor of soil and terrestrial environmental physics at the ETH in Zurich. This is the Swiss Federal Institute, really the, uh, the MIT of Europe, or maybe MIT is the ETH of North America, I don't know. But uh, Danny is really uh, the figure in soil physics uh, working today. He has a PhD from Utah State University, and that followed uh, bachelor's and master's degrees uh, from the Hebrew University in, in Jerusalem. Uh, Danny has really, uh, I think, won all the awards in, in the field of soil physics and hydrology. Um, he it was the Soil Science Society of America uh, Kirkham Soil Physics Award, really the top honor in the field. Since then, he's gone on to be named a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, a fellow of the Soil Science Society of America. Um, he is the 2013 Geological Society of America Birdsall Dreis Distinguished Lecture. Uh, you'll hear more about that from him. Uh, he's the outgoing editor-in-chief of Vado's Zone Journal. This is uh, the premier journal in soil physics. And just, uh, I think, a few weeks ago was named the Helmholtz International Fellow Award. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Danny, and you can see the title of his talk, and it's just a delight to welcome him to Saskatoon. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you, Jeff, for the kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, the weather is great. Uh, I say hello to my colleagues in uh, Calgary. They hosted me a few days ago. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to be here for this uh, double feature, really, uh, the 2013 Berzel uh, Dress uh, lectures, uh, Lecture, and I'll say more about this in the next slide, but also to launch this uh, very uh, um, high-profile breakthroughs in uh, hydrogeosciences and water security. I'll broaden the scope a bit. Um, and that puts a bit of a burden, uh, not a burden, but uh, a responsibility, not only to launch it in style, that's why I'm putting my jacket on, but also to uh, try and connect a bit with the students uh, that are not in the field uh, or audience uh, members that are not in the field of uh, soil physics in talking about um, evaporation from uh, porous uh, surfaces or porous media. Now, uh, with respect to the topic, um, I'll try and tell the story of evaporation um, uh, from the porous medium or from the soil point of view. This is because most of what we know about evaporation or read in the literature or in textbooks uh, is biased towards the atmospheric side of things, gradient in the atmosphere, remote sensing, uh, and so on. And uh, in many cases, there is the impression, and not always, that the soils are simply a passive suppliers of vapor. And uh, what I'll show you today uh, will illustrate that uh, this is far from being the case. Uh, the behavior, the processes, the mechanisms within the porous media control to a large extent not only the dynamics of evaporation, but can a priori determine how much water is lost to the atmosphere. Okay, now we lost our, uh, yeah. How much water is lost to the atmosphere uh, irrespective of the atmospheric forcing. And that's uh, quite important. 
the uh, scale of the processes I'll be talking about is the smallest of scales. We'll talk about processes all the way down to poor scale. And you'll think that this is, okay, this is uh, academically interesting, but what are the applications? Um, I can assure you, or maybe uh, you'll be convinced yourself, that the processes or the nonlinearities that emerge from these uh, poor scale processes propagate and manifest themselves even at a large scale remote sensing. And I'll explain more about what those uh, nonlinearities uh, are. So let's wait for a few. Okay. So the Berzold Rice uh, lecture series or lectureship was established as a Berzold uh, uh, lectureship by the uh, Geological Society of America in 1978 to commemorate the life and the uh, uh, achievements of John Manning Berzold, who was a prominent geologist with the Water Resources Division of the uh, uh, USGS, US Geological Survey, and following the tragic death of uh, Dr. Shirley uh, Drace, who was a, a Berzold Rice uh, lecturer uh, in 1992, uh, the uh, many friends and colleagues of her uh, contributed to the fund and uh, uh, um, asked to rename the series to be uh, Berzold Rice uh, Lecture Series. So once a year, and uh, thanks to Jeff's, <laughs> I'm uh, been select I, se I was selected this year. Um, uh, a scholar is uh, selected to give this uh, lecture series. Um, uh, the expectations are to give about 30 to 40 or 50 lectures all over the world. Uh, and that's a nice uh, initiative, not only because it, uh, it commemorates the lives and legacies of these two outstanding individuals, but it's also uh, an opportunity to serve as an ambassador for, uh, geological for the Geological Society of America and the, uh, especially the Hydrogeology Division. So I'm at the latter part of my trip. I have uh, uh, maybe seven or eight uh, lectures left, and uh, the next person will take over. <coughs> and I'm glad to be here, of course, to start to uh, to uh, to visit the uh, uh, University of Saskatchewan. So back to evaporation. Uh, let me put it in a global context, just so we understand a bit of the uh, of the magnitude of this process at the global scale. Um, evaporation consumes about 25% of the incoming solar energy. Um, uh, it's about 40,000 terawatts. Uh, just for scale, uh, the entire scope of human activity and uh, power consumption and power production amounts to about 10 to 15 terawatts. And here we're talking about 40,000 terawatts. So it's a huge, in terms of energy, it's a huge consumer of energy. The rest of the energy 50% goes to heating surfaces and oceans, and 25 is reflected back to space. Uh, from a hydrological point of view, if we focus only on terrestrial surfaces, evaporation sends back to the atmosphere about 60% of the uh, rainfall on terrestrial surfaces. Interestingly enough, uh, plants are prominent in this. Uh, they uh, send back about 40%, and soil evaporation takes uh, 20% as or the process of evaporation from soil surfaces is about 20% of this precinct. In this uh, sense, the atmosphere serves as almost an infinite sink for this vapor, relentlessly driving this process. And of course, in, uh, in, uh, it is fair to ask how much we really understand about this uh, globally significant process, the physics of this globally significant process. So of course, if we look at uh, what I said in the previous slide, uh, evaporation is, n is clearly important for land atmosphere uh, exchange, uh, energy balance uh, fluxes, but it is also important in a host of uh, many other um, in, um, engineering, um, drying of building materials, drying of wood, drying of foodstuff. Also, in the context of uh, uh, physiology, plant physiology is dependent on evaporation, we call it transpiration. Uh, the well-being of uh, various uh, organisms dependent on evaporation. Uh, contact lenses, your food, your bread, all of these things are affected by evaporation. It is uh, remarkable that uh, with all uh, the knowledge that we have accumulated over the years about this kind of transport processes, modelers among you will admit that modeling evaporation from first principle is still a challenge. It is still not so trivial and part of the reason is uh, embedded here in this figure showing evaporation rate versus uh, mass loss or versus time, showing that for the same boundary conditions, you don't change anything in the system and you look at the evaporation rate, you see a very sharp or very large changes in the flux of evaporation. 
the, uh, while we understand what these uh, changes mean in terms of mechanisms inside the porous media, uh, we call this part of the initial state of evaporation the stage one evaporation, the constant rate evaporation, and this is a falling rate or stage two. The transition between these two is not completely clear. Perhaps in talking about evaporation from porous media, it is important also to distinguish between uh, that process and evaporation from free water surfaces. And sometimes we tend to confuse the two. There, is a f there are fundamental differences between these two processes of evaporation, simply because uh, porous media tend to dry. And also, uh, during evaporation from porous media, water is being withdrawn from within the porous medium and brought up to the surface. And that's, uh, that's also different than what happens uh, during evaporation from free water surfaces. But perhaps the most important aspect for the purposes of today's talk is the fact that if you zoom in on an evaporating surface, a uh, porous surface, you'll see that evaporation is emitted from discrete pores. And that interaction of evaporation from discrete pores with the, with the boundary layer above the surface, and I'll explain what that means, give rise to nonlinearities that, although uh, originating at the pore scale, affect behavior of large surfaces, even uh, satellite imaging of uh, uh, estimation of uh, evaporation from uh, terrestrial surfaces. <coughs> By nonlinearities, maybe I should clarify, I mean that if you reduce the uh, water content of a surface by 50%, you may not reduce the evaporation rate by 50%. In fact, you may not even affect the evaporation rate. And that's kind of difficult to capture uh, when you run a model and you have to understand the process to be able to quantify this uh, phenomenon. So today, I'll try and talk about two topics related to processes in uh, soils and related to breakthrough in soil physics. I don't know if they are breakthroughs, but they are uh, processes of discovery. And for the students um, in the audience, uh, I would say that uh, when you are able to uh, answer or formulate questions and then answer those questions, not only that you may um, address the objectives of your, uh, the orig original objectives of your research, but you also allow yourself or allow science to ask more refined questions uh, that of, of uh, on uh, regarding processes in uh, neighboring systems that you didn't even intend to, to answer in the first place. So that's uh, part of the beauty of the process of discovery. And uh, today we'll ask two research questions. The first is what control this transition from stage one to stage two? Uh, again, stage one is the stage typically in, uh, in um, hydrologic textbook that will be called the constant rate period or the constant evaporation period, which is really a misnomer, as you can see right there, but I'll get back to that. Um, so what controls the transition from, this, uh, from the initial stage to stage two? And for that, we'll have to delve into the uh, capillary processes within the porous medium, and I'll try and simplify them so I didn't put any equations. You'll be glad to hear. To I'll try and simplify them so they'll uh, so even audience who are not familiar uh, members of the audience who are not familiar with soil physics will be able to follow. The second research question was what keeps evaporation rate constant as the surface gradually dry? We take it for granted, and every textbooks in uh, hydrology will tell you that there is a constant rate period and a falling rate period. But how is it possible? that you have a surface that is gradually drying, you have less and less emitters of vapor from the surface, and yet on average, the flux remains constant. In other words, if you think about it for a moment, it must mean that the remaining evaporator, evaporators must emit more vapor or be more efficient in emission of vapor to maintain this constancy of the evaporation rate. And that's something that uh, uh, in an awkward way came about by looking at uh, some of the results we have where under certain conditions we never had a constant rate and we were worried about why the rate is not constant when in fact we should have asked why the rate is constant in the first place. So to address this, we look at the interface between the soil surface and the atmosphere and look at some processes that take place right at that interface, uh, in, in particular evaporation from discrete pores and that uh, will clarify for us some of these uh, questions related to this constancy. So first, let's start with uh, looking at this transition from stage one to stage two. Uh, 
And we were wondering, uh, is the transition from stage one to stage two dependent on the evaporation rate? Is it uh, dependent on the depth of the soil column? Uh, things that are, you know, we didn't know the answers and you cannot find them in, in textbooks. And in fact, uh, it was quite revealing to see a statement by Priestley and Taylor. For those of you who are interested in uh, terrestrial evaporation, this is a, classic, uh, a classical paper on uh, large-scale evaporation. They stated that an important point on which the present analysis can throw no light is knowledge of when evaporation rate first begins to fall below the potential. And they were First, they were candid, but also they are absolutely correct because there is nothing in the atmospheric side of things to tell you about this transition. This is a phenomenon that is completely defined or determined by processes within the soil. Uh, so as I said, we didn't know what, con what affect this transition, but these are really easy experiments to, to conduct. You take uh, columns, you fill them up with soil, you saturate them, put them on a balance. You can put also a column of free water as a reference and let the uh, system evaporate and look at mass loss versus time, basically, during evaporation. And when you plot mass loss versus time, uh, instead of mass loss versus time, uh, you plot evaporation rate versus mass loss just to compress time. So if you have a slow evaporation that takes longer or a fast evaporation, basically all of these curves collapse, you see that uh, irrespective of the evaporation rate, or potential evaporation rate, or the length of the column, a transition for this particular sand happens exactly at this uh, 60 grams for this experiment of mass loss, irrespective of this uh, external condition. So that was quite interesting. But we were wondering, you know, why is it in 60 grams and not 100 or 40? For that, we used uh, uh, evaporation from uh, different material. So in this case, I'm showing you here evaporation from coarse sand and fine sand. What you'll see is that when I plot it again against evaporation depth, this is the cumulative water expressed as equivalent depth of water, uh, you'll see that the transition again happens at all rates at the same uh, cumulative evaporation rate. It happens deeper, more water is lost at the fine sand than it is in the coarse sand. So that looks kind of interesting. We're already seeing a pattern here that the transition uh, from stage one to stage two happen at a particular cumulative mass or drying from depth, and it happens deeper in fine sand than it is in coarse sand. So of course, uh, being the greedy scientists that we are, so we say, well, can we predict this? Okay, so before predicting this, let's take a step back and look at the anatomy of uh, evaporation from uh, porous media. What I'm showing you here is a cross section with a synchrotron uh, imaging of saturated sand, uh, initially and after 50 minutes of evaporation. Uh, what you have to understand about evaporation process is that it looks very much like a drainage process. It will be the same uh, drying pattern as if I open uh, 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 an outlet at the bottom of this column and let it drain. Uh, the process is, govern is governed by capillary forces. So, so as mass is being lost from the uh, top of the column, the largest pore to be invaded by gas will be the, uh, the first pores to be invaded by gas will be the largest pores and they'll continually be invaded. Uh, and if you connect, if you can imagine a connection between all these large pores, we'll call that uh, a drying front or a primary drying front. And that drying front moves downward uh, while evaporation basically happens from the surface. In other words, there is a hydraulic connections between the, the drying front and the surface. And during that process where the, the, there is a connection between the drying front and the surface, and the phase change happens at the surface, we call that state stage one. So uh, to, to make this uh, story uh, short, um, there is evidence that this process can link, uh, can is sustained by this hydraulic conti continuity. And one of the simplest models that were proposed for this process was offered by uh, Krischer back in 1956. They say, imagine the whole soil pore system as made up of two capillaries connected hydraulically connected, which means that there are uh, uh, possibilities of exchange between the walls of the capillary. Now imagine that these two capillaries as ini are initially water-filled and they are exposed to evaporation. Water will be lost. There'll be some curvatures that are forming in the two capillaries. And then after a while, the largest capillaries, will, uh, the large capillary will reach critical curvature and then basically the interface will start receding. 
whereas the uh, small capillary will remain connected to the atmosphere. And from that point onward, the uh, flow will take place from the large capillary to the s through the small capillary to the atmosphere, basically enslaving the large capillary. That process will take place until a certain depth in which the equivalent curvature in this uh, small capillary reaches also the critical curvature, which is equal to the radius of the capillary, and it's basically invaded, and that will be the end of stage one evaporation. But there is quite a bit of uh, time in which the, uh, the large capillary is being enslaved, and it mimics the motion of the drying front, uh, the primary drying front, into the porous medium. So that's the basic model that uh, Christian offered. Uh, the two keywords uh, and the translation of that into this, uh, uh, into this conceptual figure is that stage one implies that there are hydraulic connections between the, dr uh, the drying front and the surface, and stage two means that these connections are disrupted. The two keywords here are hydraulic continuity and capillary gradient. So in order to uh, develop uh, or to derive predictions for this transition, uh, we're looking at uh, a property of the porous medium that uh, satisfies these two conditions. And one of the uh, usual suspects in soil physics would be the soil water characteristic curve. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, representation, in all this forest of lines, all you have to focus at the moment are on a few data points that are actual measurements. So you have coarse sand in red and uh, fine sand in blue. There are a few data points here. And we relate the amount of water in the sample to the uh, capillary pressure by which this water is held spontaneously in the sample, or if you want, the amount of work that we need to apply to remove that water from the sample. So this relationship of quantity and, and intensity is fundamental to unsaturated porous media. And you can see that the two sands, the coarse and the fine, show different characteristics of this uh, behavior. And to these uh, data points, we fit models just to uh, bridge the gap between the data points. We call this uh, Van Gennuten model or some other names to these parametric models. So when we look at the, um, at the hydraulic continuity and capillary gradient, I need for the prediction, I can identify, let's focus for a moment on the, uh, on the fine sand, I can identify the large capillary and the small capillary in my model onto this uh, uh, macroscopic representation in which the large capillary is the point which is known in this uh, jargon as the air entry value. This is the first pore in the porous medium to be invaded during drainage or during drying, it doesn't matter. So it represents really the biggest pore in the system. And the last point in which the phase, the liquid phase is connected, is shown here. We don't have a name for it, but it's at the inflection point of this uh, characteristic curve in which uh, you can apply as much suction as you want or apply as much pressure as you want. You will not drain any amount of water because the phase, the liquid phase is disconnected. So this is the only region in which you have invasion of gas and connecti hydraulic connectivity between the pores in the system. So from these two points, we can derive a length, which we'll call the uh, evaporative characteristic length. And the arguments, or we argue, that this will be the maximum depth of the drying front before disconnection will take place and, uh, or disruption of this continuity will take place and the system will transition from stage one to stage two. So you can look at it um, and compare it to some experimental results so we estimate for the fine something like 15 centimeters, and this is really what we find. This is an image of the, uh, this is a dyed water in the sand just to, to show where the drying front is. And this is the, the same for uh, coarse sand. Uh, we predict 10 centimeters and we measure eight, or uh, there is a bunch of experiments where we repeated this. So the prediction was pretty good for coarse material. For a fine texture material, for clays and so on, there is a slight complication, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the lesson from this is that uh, we can identify onto a macroscopic property of the porous medium, the water characteristic curve, which we can measure for any porous medium, including rocks and other uh, geologic materials, uh, a length that will tell us when the system will transition from stage one to stage two without ever having to conduct an evaporation experiment. <coughs> so. So in, in other words, this is a property of the porous medium. And for those of you who are, uh, who, who are uh, 
thinking of uh, distribution, this is a property of the variance of the pore size distribution, not so much the mean of the pore. It's the distance between the smallest pore and the largest pore in the system. Okay, so I mentioned that there is a small complication, and the complication in the conceptual model means that I can make this pore smaller and smaller to drive to have a larger and larger capillary gradient, but then there is a price to pay, and that is the flow of water through this smaller and smaller tube will, uh, will be faced by larger and larger viscous resistance that will basically accelerate the disconnection because it's another force that resists flow. So we have gravity and viscous resistance resisting flow. So there is a limit to how much you can, how much, how small this pore can be, and that limit uh, imposes another constraint uh, when you look at pore ratio, the the, s the small to the large. So the smaller the pore the more important the viscous resistance. I will not dwell too much on this because it requires some, some thinking about what that pore ratio and so on. I'll just uh, jump straight to uh, applications to soils. So we can take all the soils in the world and we can plot them as a function of a parameter we call n. That parameter is a parameter of a, uh, of a, cons of a parametric model which we call the Van Newton model that feeds the data points on the retention curve or the water characteristic curve that I showed you earlier. So a sandy soils will have a large N, a clay soil will have a small N. The smallest N possible is one. So basically, by plotting the, the drying front depth at the function of the soil N, I'm spanning the whole class of soils all over the world, basically. And I collected or recollected data points from experimental uh, uh, from papers that actually reported the depth of this uh, drying front uh, uh, experimentally, uh, and this will be the lines that we predict with our model. Now, our model uh, involves some simple linearization of this characteristic curve, and you end up with a very, very simple expression. Trust me, this is a very simple expression. It has only two parameters, and give you a characteristic length. So, it's a very cheap prediction. You can take a soil map of anywhere in the world, if you can identify the, if you can identify it with a parameter n of the Van Gogh-Newton model, you can basically map the, uh, the potential evaporative losses into the atmosphere that could come out from that uh, unit of landscape. Moreover, if you have a rainfall pattern that uh, infiltrates water into the soil, you can, you can calculate how much of that water will be safe, will, uh, uh, infiltrate below the depth of this uh, characteristic length and will therefore will not be pulled out by evaporation. So we can do a lot of things uh, that we have not done yet uh, with a very simple predictor that is based now on this uh, fundamental understanding of these uh, processes. So this is uh, basically the, um, the, the, uh, the work. We started with the question of what determined the transition from stage one to stage two evaporation. We identified a characteristic length that is spanned by the pore size distribution of the porous medium, which means it is a phenomena uh, that is completely related to the porous medium and not to the boundary condition or the atmospheric boundary conditions. And with that characteristic length, we can define when the transition will happen, how much, depending on how much water was lost from the soil, but also we can make more predictions that may be useful for climate models or for uh, water resources management over larger scale. But it also, and that's back to the student's uh, um, uh, discovery process, it also allows us to ask the following question. If we can do this for a pair of capillaries, can we actually do this for a pair of domains of porous media that is made up of large pores and small pores brought together very much like the, the uh, small capillary and large capillary? So it turns out that evaporation from this completely fabricated scenario in which you have two domains of porous media in hydraulic contact evaporating through the atmosphere uh, result in some behavior that is completely unpredicted uh, from the behaviors of the individual components of the system. And what you get is a bit of uh, magic. So these are the two same sands that we had before. When you, uh, uh, you run an experiment where you have half of the column is coarse and half it is fine, this is a blue dye to mark the water. You'll see that the drying front moves exclusively in the course, very much like the drainage of that single capillary. And water is being pulled through the fine, uh, and the dye is deposited preferentially over the fine. In fact, I have a, a little um, 
video here to uh, kind of mimic this process. So pores are invaded in the coarse domain first, up to the characteristic lengths of the coarse domain, and then they continue now to invade. So basically what we have is now water being extracted from the uh, combined system to a much larger depth that is spanned by the largest pore in the cores and the finest cores in the fine that are uh, in contact with each other. This is just give us a hint that heterogeneous systems are going to lose more water to evaporation than homogeneous systems. Just to uh, convince you that the, uh, there is actually enslavement of the coarse domain by the fine domain, we run an experiment in our equivalent to your synchrotron here, but we have there also a, a neutron radiography beam, beam line where we can fill the water with deuterium, uh, the bottom of the column with deuterium, the top with regular water. This is just dyed in blue for clarity to show that they are not very mixed. And zooming in on this top part of the column, you see that the heavy water is reflecting uh, the neutron. It looks white, bright, and the regular water looks dark. And when I run the, uh, the evaporation, maybe I'll stop it here, you'll see again that the evaporation uh, front or the drying front moves exclusively in the coarse sand. And once it passed the boundary, I should expect that the, uh, the boundary of this heavy water, uh, regular water, will start migrating up as being pulled by the uh, evaporation stream. And in fact, this is what happens. So we can see direct evidence that, uh, that uh, there is a, a lateral exchange between the evaporating domain, the fine texture medium, and pulling the water from the coarse uh, medium. Maybe um, we run a bunch of experiments uh, uh, looking at different fraction of the fine and coarse. Just to summarize these, two, these experiments is that always in the combined uh, columns, we always had more evaporation in the combined column than in the pure columns of the fine and the coarse. So that, that looks uh, very interesting, but how relevant it is to uh, natural systems uh, where we don't have really the confinement of the walls of a column. So we did a calculation for a natural system in which you can imagine we have inclusions of fine texture media due to uh, uh, aeolian entrapment over shrubs or some other mechanism that creates fine inclusions uh, in a background of a coarse or a coarser material. The problem, the way it is formulated, it looks very much like the pumping well problem except that the boundary conditions are different and the pumping power is dependent on the capillary properties of the two, of the inclusion and the background. Uh, the results are summarized here. It's kind of a difficult figure to see, but uh, let me try and explain it. This is the radius of influence, this uh, lateral extent away from the inclusion, and this is the evaporation rate. Evaporation rate is here is important because it's a viscous process, so you dissipate a hydraulic gradient by viscous flow, so the, the faster the flow, the more dissipation you have. So evaporation rate is a player. And what you see is that for a um, very uh, low evaporation rate of one, say, millimeter per day, you can have uh, radii of influence of in excess of 10 meters or more, uh, whereas for high evaporation rate, this radius of influence shrinks, basically. Uh, and the, the different line represent different combinations of clay and sand, um, loam and sand, and so on. So this uh, um, lateral extraction by evaporation has some uh, range of influence that is significant. It's not negligible, and I think uh, uh, I talked earlier today, some people who do research in the f uh, with Uri and others on the lateral extent of, uh, of uh, salt exchange between ponds and their neighborhood. So this will be the ranges that you would expect, and in fact, uh, we can predict this uh, based on this uh, analysis. How important this is in real field conditions, nobody knows. We don't know. We have, not done, we have no evidence, nor have we uh, collected information to, to answer this question. So it's a wide open question yet. But there are some uh, insights that can be derived from this analysis. One is that the range of influence or the impact on the landscape will be dependent on the nature of the heterogeneity, and that's really not surprising. If you have many, many inclusions or a few big inclusions, the margins will comprise different parts of the landscape, that's clear. But I guess the most important aspect has to do with the, with the upscaling or homogenization. You cannot find an equivalent properties to describe this phenomena by averaging the 
the properties of the fine of the inclusion and the background. Very much like if you take a candle and shred it in, a, in your shredder and form it again to a candle, it's not going to work the same way. The same way here, this uh, process is dependent on domain segregation. And if you homogenize the domains, you basically lose the phenomena. So that just gives us a bit of uh, a warning sign for uh, upscaling or finding homogeneous properties. Some of this homogenization must respect the process, and this process depends on keeping the domain seg domains segregated. So enough about this first part of the uh, objectives, uh, the first objective of my talk. Let's move to the second objective. In the second objective, uh, we ask ourselves what keeps the evaporation constant, evaporation rate constant, despite the fact that the surface is constantly drying or gradually drying. Uh, as I said, our curiosity uh, uh, to ask this question came from the fact that we looked at uh, evaporation. So the red here will be a coarse sand and the blue will be fine sand. When we had low evaporation rate below 5 millimeters per day, we always got this constant evaporation rate and transition as we expected classically. But when we had, when we imposed uh, higher wind speed and we got evaporation rate greater than 5 millimeters per day, we always had this dropping evaporation rate from the outset of the experiment. It was very curious and we were wondering what's going on. Uh, we checked that the hydraulic conductivity that supplied the water to the surface was not limiting, that there was no issues of uh, connectivity because this started from, uh, from the first minute of the experiment. Uh, and we were able by process of elimination to reduce or to identify the transition or the mass exchange between the surface and the atmosphere as the limiting step to this uh, exchange process. To better understand this, we have to zoom in on the surface. So this will be a, a surface uh, with airflow above it, marked here by these arrows, and uh, discrete pores evaporating through the airflow. So above this, so there is a domain which we call the boundary layer. That's a, a domain <coughs> that marks the uh, the transition from some average uh, wind speed to zero at the surface. That is a domain across which the gradient and vapor is forming. Above this domain, we have well-mixed air. And below this domain, we have the saturated surface or the wet surface. So the gradient of vapor is across this uh, domain. The thickness of this domain varies with wind speed, as you can see in this figure here, as experimental results. Uh, as you increase the wind velocity, the thickness of this domain, of this boundary layer, uh, drops. Uh, and it varies from, say, 10 millimeters for uh, very low wind speeds, almost zero, to less than a millimeter for very high wind speed, I don't know, maybe 10 meters per second. So these are the ranges of wind speed that you can find in uh, natural systems. And this will be the ranges of this uh, boundary layer thickness that uh, uh, across which vapor is transported uh, above an evaporating surface. Uh, now, the, the rub here is that uh, the, the uh, drying of a surface involved knocking out pores that were previously water-filled and evaporating. And, they are done, and this is done in a sequence where the largest pores are knocked out first and then smaller pores later. In the process, uh, if you imagine a surface made up of pores of these sizes, and the colors represent different sizes. As you remove pores, you're left uh, at some point with the smallest of pores where the distances between these pores uh, are larger and larger. Now, this, uh, this fact will turn out to be quite crucial for the understanding of this phenomena. So we have uh, drying of a surface, uh, increasing of spacings between the pores. Uh, and let's consider for a moment that the boundary layer uh, is fixed. The boundary layer. And that's an argument that always gets me in trouble with fluid mechanics people. The boundary layer, of course, is a, is a result of convection or momentum transfer to the surface. Um, I argue in this analysis that the convection, the convective part of the wind speed, contribute nothing to the vapor generation or to the vapor flux. It does set the boundary condition. It sets the thickness of the boundary layer. That's correct. But that's it as far as the exchange process. So the process is a diffusion-dominated process where the convection part is mostly contributing to setting the boundary condition, but not to the transport of it. So this is just to separate the problem of transport of vapor in the atmosphere, which is very important, but it's irre irrelevant to the process of evaporation or mass loss or mass generation from the surface. Nobody throwing shoes on me? That's perfect. So 
in modeling this uh, process, uh, 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 we can uh, rely on some work that was done uh, back in the 60s, in fact, back in the 20s. Uh, maybe some of you know about Sherwood's number. So Sherwood did his PhD at MIT in 1920 something, 28, and his work was on drying sand. So he was already studying this problem. But some of the classical papers were done by, uh, were presented by Suzuki Maeda and uh, later on by Schlunder in 1988. What these guys have done, and you can see here images from their uh, work, uh, they looked at advection. Uh, uh, along the surface and diffusion across that advective stream uh, and basically solve the problem of evaporation from discrete pores. And that's basically the, the basic model that we're going to use. We refine the model looking at capillary forces, looking at emptying of pores and so on that they have not done, but this is really less important for the understanding of this problem. We also conducted experiments in some homemade uh, wind tunnel in our uh, laboratory where we can fix the boundary condition, fix the, uh, the thickness of the boundary layer, and look at different uh, rates of evaporation. Um, so let me uh, show you some of the results. And the first part of the results are theoretical results, which is the heart of, the, of this part of the talk. Imagine a surface that is made up of pores of the same size, put on a uh, placed on a lattice, on a regular lattice, and the way we dry the surface is by increasing the spacings between the pores. So this is just a thought experiment. You have a, por a porous surface evaporating, and you increase the spacings between the pores, and you plot now the evaporation, the relative evaporation rate relative to a free water surface as a function of the, of the relative area of the pores and on a unit surface, very much like a water content. What you get for a constant boundary layer, in this case, in this computation of two millimeters, what you get is that depending on the size of the pores, you'll get different uh, uh, evaporation curve. If you have large pores of 10 millimeters, remember the boundary layer here of the order of 2 millimeters, if you have uh, uh, pores of the order of 10 millimeters, reducing the evaporating area by 50% will reduce the evaporation rate by 50%. However, if you have pores of the orders of 100 microns or 10 microns, you may reduce the evaporating area by 90, 95% with almost no impact on the evaporation rate. So this is uh, quite uh, strange if you think about it. Uh, so of course, uh, we're trying to understand what's going on here. So the first thing that you'll see is that as you reduce, as you increase the spacings between the pores, you move from a one-dimensional diffusion field where the gradient is primarily vertical to a, to a collection of three-dimensional diffusion field where you have above each of these active pores a shell of vapor. And if you can think about it a bit, you'll, you basically are adding a dimension for the flux to be uh, enhanced. So with the increasing of spacings between the pores, you may enhance the flux per pore and compensate for the loss of pores uh, that are, you know, in the case of a drying surface, that were knocked out by the drying process. Uh, more specifically, the, uh, the amount of uh, the, uh, the efficiency of that uh, flux compensation will depend on the size of the pores, the thickness of the boundary layer, and the spacing between the pores. So these are the three uh, distances involved in this process. Uh, just to show you how it looks like from the flux point of view, I'll take this, uh, this uh, same result and plot the evaporation or the relative evaporation rate per pore that is the evaporation rate per pore relative to that of uh, uh, a free water surface uh, of the same area, a one-dimensional evaporation of the same area. And what you'll see is that for uh, large pores, you basically have, uh, uh, you have basically no flux, uh, no increase in the flux with the reduced space, with the increased spacing between the pores, whereas for the small pores, you can have an increase of 15 uh, times the flux per pore as you increase the spacings between the pores. And if I go back to this slide, this will explain why plant uh, leaves, for example, that the, with average pores of stomata of the order of 10 microns or 5 microns can evaporate like a free water surface with about 1% uh, or less than 1% of the evaporating area of a free surface. This is because the, uh, the flux per pore from flux per stoma, per stoma 
from a plant leaf will be much, much higher because of this three-dimensional structure than that from a free water surface. And that is the mechanism of flux compensation that takes place during a drying of a, a surface, or we claim it takes place during a drying of a surface. Just to illustrate this visually, how the diffusion field looks like as I increase the spacings between the pores, uh, basically what I'm doing here is I'm increasing the spacing, I'm reducing the water content, the evaporative flux per pore increases, and, uh, but of course uh, with this uh, few pores I cannot compensate for this loss and basically I see a net drop in the evaporation rate per area from this uh, example here. But uh, visually you can see the organization of the diffusion field and this is actually uh, three-dimensional solutions of the diffusion problem for this, uh, for this case. So to summarize this part, the way we, we understand now the constant rate evaporation uh, involves this, uh, this uh, dilution or increase in spacing between active pores. With this uh, uh, increased spacing, we, we see an increase in the uh, flux per pores, per active pores, and now it depends on the boundary layer. If the boundary layer is thick enough to accommodate a full development of a vapor uh, uh, um, cap above the pores will get a full flux compensation. If the, if the boundary layer relative to the pore size is too thin, we will not get the full compensation and basically we'll either get, for a thick boundary layer, we'll get a constant rate evaporation for a constant input energy into the system, whereas for a thin boundary layer, we'll never get a constant rate. As we knock out pores, we get a drop in the evaporation rate. That's basically how we can reconcile these two results for the same porous medium uh, and different boundary conditions. Okay, so how relevant is this results to applications, you may ask? I'll show you two examples. One is related to estimation or to these nonlinear effects I alluded to earlier about between uh, soil moisture and evaporation rate. These are data from say, two years ago where people measure constantly or this or consistently this uh, relationship here that uh, um, the you may have for a wide range of soil moisture no change in evaporation rate and then a drop. Uh, this information uh, is essential for estimating evaporation rate from remote sensing of surfaces by the moisture by water content and what people are using is some resistance term that is a function of the water content given here so here surface resistance as a function of water content but this resistance term that is now used, I think, in almost all NASA products, is an empirical construct. It has no, uh, it doesn't take into consideration the soil properties and consider the boundary layer effect. It is really, it's just uh, 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 an empirical function that they plug in into this estimate. Whereas with this analysis that we conducted here, we can actually remove this empiricism and uh, plug in a solution for this same resistance that is dependent or sensitive to the soil properties, to the boundary layer thickness, and to the water content in a predictive and, uh, and non-empirical way. And these are some of the results, and we have a paper that just came out in WRR on how to apply this uh, methodology. We also uh, account for viscous resistance, but this is not important for this talk. Uh, the last example is for designing res uh, covers for reservoir to suppress evaporation. This is a big problem in Australia and other places where evaporative losses from reservoirs can amount to large losses. Um, and people are, are planning uh, all kind of uh, covers, floating covers on these reservoirs. And now all the audience who have been paying any attention to this talk will know uh, if you have to design a reservoir uh, cover, would you use small pores or large pores in your cover? Of course, large pores. I can see you all agreeing. So the idea is that if you use small pores, you basically behave like a plant leaf. And you can cover almost 90% of your reservoir with almost no suppression of evaporation. Whereas if you use large holes or large pores in your cover, uh, by the time you cover the reservoir by 50%, you will reduce the evaporation from that reservoir by 50% and so on. So that's another application of this understanding to some uh, practical solutions involving suppression of evaporation and so on. And you can, and uh, you, you may have other examples for, I don't know, designing bricks or other, other uh, applic uh, engineering applications for that involve evaporation. So to summarize, 
Uh, in the first part of my talk, I talked about the transition from stage one to stage two, and we identified um, uh, a critical depth uh, that uh, determined the transition from stage one to stage two. And as I, as I promised, it really was not a function of the atmospheric boundary conditions, but rather a property of the porous medium. What's remarkable is during this time that we have a constant rate of evaporation, this is what's happening below the surface. And nobody would have been able to say, you know, that, uh, you know, th that just looking at the constant rate of evaporation doesn't tell you about how, much, how many changes are happening below the surface. And that's quite remarkable that the system organizes itself to maintain a constant rate of evaporation at all. The way this works, as we saw in the second part, had to do with the uh, interaction between the boundary layer or the subviscous layer just above the surface, the, s the thickness of that boundary layer, the size of the pores, and the spacings between the pores. These three um, characteristic lengths uh, come to play to determine whether we'll have a constant rate evaporation or we'll have a falling rate evaporation from the beginning of the, of the experiment or the evaporation process. Um, I guess this should convince you uh, no longer to use uh, uh, stage one and constant rate, uh, constant rate period as synonymous because they are not, there is no such thing as constant rate period unless you have a certain uh, uh, combination of uh, parameters. Um, these uh, results are useful for establishing top boundary conditions for uh, climate models, for uh, hydrologic models. And nowadays we're using them to develop energy balance of surfaces and we can now predict the uh, Boyne ratio of drying surfaces and the Priestley-Taylor coefficient, the alpha for those who are familiar with this, uh, a priori based on the system characteristics and that's quite an advancement uh, in testing and verifying uh, some uh, remote sensing models. Again, all the, trans the transition all the way from a single pore to, uh, to remote sensing. So with this, I'd like to acknowledge uh, financial support by the Swiss National Foundation and the Derm uh, German Research Foundation, DFG, uh, and the numerous uh, contributions made by uh, Peter Lehmann, uh, 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 Nima Shukri, uh, Ibrahim Sharaini, uh, Danny Breitenstein, our technician, and uh, Shmuel Asulin, my colleague on the water reservoir covers uh, studies. And of course, you for your attention. Thank you very much. Danny. So for the, uh, the benefit of those that are uh, listening to the simulcast version of this, I'll use the microphone just because this is the way that uh, it's communicated over the web and take some questions for Danny. And what I might try to do is uh, perhaps repeat them for others to hear. Um, so we'll open up for questions and I really encourage the students in the 898 class to, uh, to jump in with uh, further questions. We ran out of time today. Yeah. So yeah. maybe Danny, you can just repeat the question. For yeah, the, the question was uh, yeah, what types of uh, uh, that clays I mentioned that clays may introduce complications, and what types of complications I was referring to. The complications uh, uh, were mostly for this simple capillary gravity uh, relationship that that I deduced from the characteristic curve. Uh, that is not sufficient to establish the, the transition depth, and you have to consider the hydraulic conductivity. And basically, in clays, this transition will happen earlier, in other words, shallower depth, because of the addition of viscous losses, and we are including those in the prediction. So uh, in our model, we have those, uh, those um, uh, incorporated into the prediction of the global uh, characteristic depth. They are also responsible for many other factors that uh, cracking, there are stresses that develop within the clay, the clay that uh, result in cracking and so on. So they are, we tried uh, to work with clays uh, to do experiments and it was uh, a colossal failure. So <laughs> we, we end up looking at cement and uh, rock to actually look at small pores and we are not done with that. 
um, the, um, the, uh, the matrix potential associated with the transition is really at that inflection point where things are very poorly defined anyway. So this construct, if you say that the transition will happen at that point is kind of uh, a bit of hand waving. You just take a tangent. But uh, the details of what happens at that transition are still um, uh, quite complicated. And they may involve uh, water films and other contributors to this uh, continuity. So um, this is basically uh, 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 just a general, a general prediction, the details of which will have to be resolved because it's qu they're quite sensitive. To the transition is quite sensitive to what happens here. You're, you're right. But uh, what we measured, at least in the materials that we could work with, the coarser materials, silt and s sand, uh, it was quite, uh, the pressures, the metric potential were not too negative at the transition. And you can see it, actually. You can measure it and you can see the transition. Have you seen the book um, Design in Nature? It's by Adrian Bejan at Duke University. He's a mechanical engineer. And he has this kind of constructal law that uh, relates to, you know, how water moves in the, in, on Earth, in, uh, typically in response to the second law, but in an organized hierarchical way. And I guess, I don't know if you've read the book Design in Nature, he's just published, but it's, it's so intriguing to listen to your, your, uh, your slides, particularly the constant evaporation rate and the transition, and to kind of think those constructal thoughts that, uh, you know, Bayesian yeah, I, I know of his work, uh -huh. but I haven't read the book. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen some papers. Yeah, Ali. Yeah, uh, so the question, I'll repeat it, uh, what happens when you have uh, other sources of water, for example, flow from groundwater or irrigation? Um, I'll separate the flow from groundwater from that of irrigation. So in natural systems, we don't start with the saturated soil. We start with the soil that, you know, it's some water content, we apply rainfall or irrigation. There's a slug of water. That slug of water will move down with gravity as it evaporates. So there is two processes simultaneously taking place. And of course, many of the simplification that I was able to make in the saturated case are out the window. We have to solve a more complicated problem. So that's, that's the case of irrigation. For groundwater, uh, there is a paper by my former student, Nima Shokri, who actually uh, looked at this. And it turned out that um, many of the uh, predictions of uh, pooling of water from groundwater that are uh, floating around in the literature are, are extremely exaggerated because the rules that apply to this continuity apply also to groundwater. So the, you know, the, the numerical solution that you get from, uh, say, uh, solving uh, Gardner and Parman and others of the steady state uh, solution are simply incorrect because they, they do a great job in capturing the gradient, but they are not paying attention to continuity. Conti continuity is a discrete, you know, at some point, the flow takes place in films at such a low rate that basically everything shuts down. So they found that most of the, of the coupling between surface and groundwater ends at maybe a meter and a half, almost no more than that. So you'll see a lot of papers even in Nature Geoscience about coupling between groundwater and evaporation. I would be a bit, uh, worried about that. Okay, we're just uh, a little bit after five, and I think uh, we'll, we'll wrap up now. We'll thank uh, University of Manitoba, Calgary, Alberta, and UBC for joining us. Uh, thank everyone for coming. Danny is going to be around for uh, the next several minutes, and there's a move afoot to go to Alexander's uh, for the next hour, hour and a half, and Anna Coles will be leading that charge, so watch for Anna. And uh, please join Danny there with Anna. I need to go catch a flight, so I won't join you this evening, but uh,
uh, that would be a time for further uh, discussions. Anyway, thanks again, Danny, for Thank a really stimulating talk. Thank you.